Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody who's joining us either here at the NOC in Southampton or online. Um, my name is Hugh Gullick, and I'm Associate Director for Knock Innovation here at the NOC. And I'm really pleased to be chairing this session today, not least because of our excellent panellists, who I'll introduce in a second, but also because this subject is so relevant to all of us and really elegantly follows that thread between pure science and research and the solutions that we can all see, touch and experience. As humanity, we're at a critical crossroads in terms of our interaction with the planet. The decisions that we're making today and continue to make over the next few years will define how we live long into the future and work and interact with our most critical resources. In some senses, this is an incredibly empowering position for us. Whether we like it or not, we've got the power to define the future for our generations. In so many areas, we've got answers and solutions. We've got the engineering capability. We've got the wider societal support for climate change. But on the other hand, we still know so little about our planet. We're asking ourselves to build solutions without truly understanding the impact of those solutions. And for me, climate change solutions are not therefore just about finding a way to reduce carbon emissions or deal with carbon dioxide that already exists in the atmosphere. It's about how we do this in the most informed way possible, such that the solutions we choose today don't become the problems of tomorrow. So joining me to discuss this topic are four world leading scientists from the NOC. Uh, Dr. Michaela uh, de Dominicis is a senior scientist in Knox Marine Systems Modeling Group. Her particular area of expertise is understanding how the ocean interacts with any external factors, such as direct human intervention and climate change. Through her ocean modeling research, she understands the changes that might take place in the ocean in the next few decades, and is particularly interested in the sort of what if scenarios for things such as large arrays of offshore renewable energy infrastructure, wind turbines, underwater tidal turbines, and the response of coastal areas to extreme storms, sea level rise, and different coastal protection measures. Professor Doug Connolly is Associate Director for Research at the NOC. He's a marine uh, biogeochemist with a long history looking at a range of science questions that stretch right through from underwater volcanoes through to climate change mitigation using carbon capture and storage. Doug has worked in various roles all over the world during his career, and he's regarded as the top scientist for discovering and understanding hydrothermal vents. He's found hydrothermal vents in every, every ocean in the world <laughs> on the planet, and that includes the deepest ever found in the Caribbean Sea. He's also the UK stakeholder representative on ICOS, which is the International Carbon Observing System. Dr. Claire Evans is a senior biogeochemist whose area of expertise is in understanding and integrating biogeochemical bio cycles <laughs> <It's a difficult laughs> <laughs> into the larger socio-economic context. Carbon sequestration is uh, her principal focus uh, and research, um, and that encompasses themes such as blue carbon and integrated coastal zone management. For her research, Claire employs quite a pan-disciplinary approach by working closely with a range of different scientists um, and engineers as well, with different expertise to build up a really rounded scientific picture of the environment that she's studying. This is particularly important for a number of stakeholders that Claire works with, um, as her scientific knowledge and understanding um, is really key to making off uh, economic and societal based uh, decisions. And finally, Chris Pierce. Dr. Chris Pierce is a marine geoscientist whose research aims to better understand the processes that cause and help mitigate global climate change. His expertise is in geochemical techniques has enabled him to investigate how global systems and biogeochemical processes are affected by environmental per... <laughs> This is a difficult bio <laughs> perturbations, <laughs> as, as well as how long the planet took to recover from past climatic events. Uh, Chris is currently using that knowledge to investigate potential mechanisms for combating modern climate change, such as enhanced rock weathering and carbon capture and storage, with a particular focus on the application of state-of-the-art technologies to monitor and assess both the efficiency and environmental impacts of those approaches. Craig, I'm glad I've got those, uh, <laughs> those out of the way, so thank you. That's great. So I'm going to start with um, a, a, a question, just looking more at the, um, the landscape, I guess, in terms of climate change solutions. And, and Doug, I'm going to sort of direct this one to you, if I may, with that sort of overarching view. So I think 
Yeah, the majority of people are aware that we've got a range of solutions for reducing carbon emissions, electric cars, renewable energy sources, etc. So, uh, you know, a plethora of solutions, if you like. Could you give us a bit of an idea of the scale of some of the sort of less well-known solutions, perhaps, and, and maybe how well they develop they are in relation to things that we know about? I was sort of split into two with Claire, actually, because Claire can probably talk to the more sort of the biological basis. Uh, I spend most of my time doing the sort of interventionist approach, sort of carbon capture and storage, direct air capture. Um, you know, we're producing about two tons of CO2 per person per year on this planet, which is about 36 gigatons per year. And we've got, obviously, climate change as a response to that release. The idea of using basically capturing that CO2 and storing it in some way or reusing it is actually a driver behind a lot of the sort of more industrial interventionist approaches. To give you some idea of the scale, we, we've estimated in terms of storing CO2 just for the UK, we can store 500 years of CO2 emissions from the UK current emissions just in the North Sea Basin alone, using a combination of depleted oil and gas reservoirs or, or um, sort of sea aquifers. So in terms of so the, 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 the space to store the CO2, we've got it. It's um, a relatively developed area of research. Uh, the slight number of um, CCS programs has been capturing CO2 uh, in the North Sea of, of Norway since about 1997, and they've captured and stored a million tons of CO2 every year since then. So it is a demonstrated and proven technology. It's just not been used at, at the scale we're probably going to need into the future. And um, so uh, it, it's sort of one of the low hanging fruits, really. Um, it is purely a mitigation and a stopgap. It is not the solution to producing CO2. It just offsets what we're producing at the moment. Whereas some of Claire's work, I can hand on to you on to the bio approaches. Sure. So um, the sort of work that me and Chester did in terms of mitigating uh, the climate crisis, as it were, um, basically utilizes natural solutions. So nature has a fantastic way to actually capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, and that's via photosynthesis. So what we're looking to do is utilize that process and try and control it in the marine environment. And you might think, well, how can we do this? So there's a number of ways, and you spoke about feasibility. So some of them are quite easy and straightforward, and then some are more complex and have various problems associated with them. But talking about the one first that people have probably heard about, and that's this term blue carbon. So blue carbon means different things to different people, but mainly it's, it's associated with coastal vegetated habitats. So these typically we're thinking about things like mangrove, seagrass and salt marsh. So these occur around the coast and what they do they're really good at trapping organic matter either in e either excuse me in the biomass of the plants or in the soils or sediments below the plants themselves and once that that organic matter or that carbon is locked up there it literally remains for millennia so it's a natural process that effectively captures a lot of carbon dioxide now, the scary thing about this is that we are actually losing these ecosystems at the fastest rate of any ecosystem on the planet. And so I would say 101 of carbon sort of or managing this, this sort of carbon problem we have is stop that degradation. So that's kind of stage one, if you like. And then stage two would actually be to try and restore some of these habitats as well. So altogether, uh, sort of trying to manage better those coastal habitats could provide something like 3% of um, the total sort of solutions that we need to get us to the 30 sort of gigaton of carbon dioxide removal by 2030. So it's something in that order. But also we need to consider when we think about the, the biological aspects of um, controlling carbon capture in the ocean, it goes beyond these um, coastal vegetated habitats. And so there's lots of other uh, potential technologies or techniques that we can use. And I think um, we can't at this point in time discount anything, although some of them are more controversial than others. So for example, I'm thinking of things like 
growing seaweed because that of course also captures this carbon and then there's there's some proposals that we could capture this carbon and then sink that seaweed down into the deep ocean and there's other ideas as well about things like fertilizing the ocean to stimulate phytoplankton growth so the single celled uh, organisms the plants that grow in the ocean surface so trying to stimulate those and get them to sort of sink out and capture the carbon that way However, what I want to say is that those solutions are far less well constrained. And so there's definitely a, a need for more research. Um, but I don't know if Chris wants to come in as well on the enhanced weathering. There's another ocean yeah. solution. Yeah, absolutely. There's an awful lot of uh, new techniques and technologies being explored in the ocean space for capturing and removing atmospheric CO2. And I think it's worth remembering that um, uh, the, the oceans are naturally absorbing uh, CO2 from the air constantly. Um, and I think it's over 20% of all CO2 reduced, uh, produced by human activities has been naturally sequestered into the ocean. So they're doing a fundamental job on their own at capturing what we are emitting into the atmosphere over and beyond uh, natural processes. So what, we, uh, what a lot of people are looking at is a way to actually enhance those natural processes of actually encouraging that atmospheric CO2 into the oceans where it can ultimately be sequestered in the types of air approaches that Claire's just alluded to. Some of those are biologically driven through the, the productivity cycles, and some of them are inorganically driven through natural processes and mineral formation, mineral dissolution processes. And so this uh, uh, dissolution of rocks and minerals, uh, either in beach environments or actually applied in open ocean settings, is one proposal to naturally uh, enhance alkalinity, which would encourage this drawdown of our CO2 into the seawater and at the same time offset the, the potential for ocean acidification as a consequence of that process. But again, I, I echo what Claire said, there's a lot more research needed to be done into the, the environmental and uh, ecosystem impacts of those approaches, because these technologies are, are very new. They have potential to help, but not as much potential as reducing the emissions in the first place. So everything we've discussed there has to be uh, an equivalent to the reduction of emissions in the first instance. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. I, I, you know, when I, when I look at this sort of from a sort of top level view, it's, it's quite easy to see a range of these solutions and sort of put some in the kind of engineering pot and then the, the sort of natural based solutions. I guess I'll just throw this out there, you know, thinking about it in that way, you know, where, where in your view should we be putting the focus, the investment, the government horsepower? You know, if we were to pick, pick two, you know, where, where would that focus be and how should that focus be directed to really accelerate the, I guess, the rollout of some of these solutions? I, I can make a comment <laughs> just to start. And I think, um, so my colleagues on the, the panel may not agree, um, but personally, I would definitely make one of those two restoration of our, our natural environment. And the reason why um, some components of the panel might say, no, that's, that's not where I would go, is because perhaps it, it, you know, other technologies have greater potential to, to capture carbon. However, it's, it's known as a no regret scenario. You know, you're restoring the natural functioning of the, the marine environment. And this doesn't just come with the capture of um, carbon dioxide. It also comes with a host of other benefits to society. So I think just restoring those habitats and we get back gains on biodiversity, sediment stabilization, you know, buffering pH, the list goes on and on and on. So, but yeah. <laughs> I thought you might go there. Yeah. Um, but no, it's true. And it's not just that, it's, 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 it's storm damage. You know, classic ones in the sort of monsoon damage in Pakistan, they've restored 50,000 hectares of mangroves. And it's in those areas we restored, the damage from the last monsoon was minimal compared mm. to those areas where it was exposed. So there are those extra benefits. For me, in terms of instant or a quick thing, it would be the rollout of CCS, which we are seeing now. So the UK government and the US government have committed to this. Uh, Norway's rolling out new programs around carbon capture and storage because technologically it's available now. It's it, economically, it's going to be quite interesting in terms of how it stimulates reuse of areas such as um, the areas of, in North Scotland uh, because there's depleted oil and gas reservoirs. We're seeing a natural ramp down in hydrocarbon production in the North Sea area. You know, by using a, by developing a CCS industry, it, we can bring jobs back to those areas. So from an economic point of view, we're seeing it in the US, the US are now looking at using the Gulf of Mexico. So it's a proven technology, it has its 
you know, proponents and, and opponents in as much as, um, as Chris might be able to talk to is this, we need to be able to demonstrate to the public it's safe. And uh, do you want to refer about how we've done the monitoring and verification? Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I, I think um, just before I get into that, Doug, I'm just going to say there are quick wins, there are win wins, but there's no single win. And, and I think you need, it's, it's perhaps leading to say which, which one or two would we choose because we need to look at them all. I think you can't identify a single approach because we need everything. We need every strategy on the table. We need to be investigating these, um, which has the most potential, which has a long term potential and which are non-viable. And, and this is where uh, this, this issue of reporting, uh, monitoring and verification comes into play because we need to understand uh, what the potential impacts could be in, in long-term uh, situations, but also to the ecosystems that surround them. And as you alluded to in your opening statements, you know, we need to know that these are, these solutions are not going to become the problems of tomorrow or even the problems of here and now for the organisms out in those environments. And to that end, we have uh, been developing here at the NSC in a whole array of uh, uh, sensor technologies that can be deployed for very long periods of time at the bottom of the oceans, in the surface oceans, in a whole array of coastal environments. So we need to get those technologies uh, demonstrated. We're constantly developing and enhancing them and actually deploy them in the settings that, uh, that these techniques uh, could be actually applied to demonstrate their capability for long-term assessments, both ecologically and in the context of uh, looking at the CO2 sequestration potential. No, thank you. So, Michaela, you, I guess you're in the envious position here of looking at all these solutions and trying to take a view on the impact of these going forward on the entire ocean system. What, what's your take on, on these different types of solutions and the potential impact that they may well have in the wider environment? I think we are missing one of the possible ocean solutions, which is uh, marine renewables, because it's uh, we can mitigate, we can capture the CO2, but we have to reduce the emissions in the first place. So, and, and, and there are several different types of marine renewables that uh, they are under development right now from tidal stream turbines, tidal barrages, uh, wave converters, and, and then also offshore wind farms, which is probably the uh, most mature one, and it's the one that we are going to see in the next year. Actually, we have already offshore wind farms, but they are going to move farther offshore, they're going to become floating. And I think that in the next few years, we are going to see a big expansion of this. And then probably after that, maybe tidal strip turbines and so on, because we need all the possible technology that are out there. Just following off that, I'll stick with you if I may, Michaela. You know, you could take a really cynical view of this and say, you know, we've built 60 years of oil and gas infrastructure all over the place. And, you know, whilst that might sort of decommission and drop off, we're going to go and stick a load more metal in the in the sea and all the vessels that need to go out and all the noise and cable arrays. You know, in, in your view, what do we need to be really conscious of when we do that, just from an environmental impact yeah. perspective? Yeah, so I think that the problem of the oil and gas energy industry, I mean, the main problem was not the infrastructure that is at sea. The problem is that we need to move away from that because of the greenhouse gases emissions, basically. And with marine renewables, we don't have that. At the same time, if we have an accident in a wind farm, something breaks, we don't risk having any oil spill, pollution, chemical contamination, and so on. But going back to the infrastructure itself, it's true that we want to be extra careful and, um, and we don't want to exchange one environmental crisis with another one. So I think it's, it's a problem of, uh, of the scale of the development, because if we are going to put one wind turbine, one tidal stream turbine, the environmental impacts are going to be small, negligible. The problem is that the um, future plants are to have like 40 gigawatt of uh, wind from, uh, of energy from offshore wind. 40 gigawatts is the equivalent of 10 big, very big power plants. So extracting that from the North Sea can have an impact. Uh, it, it means uh, putting to the North Sea like 7,000 turbines, something like that. And the difference with the, the structure of the, um, 
oil and gas platforms is that in the, I think in the whole world, we have like 7,000 platforms. And instead we are putting 7,000 wind turbines in the North Sea, or at least this is the plan. So what I'm not saying that this is gonna be, it's gonna be wrong or it's gonna have a negative effect, but we need to understand what is going to happen in advance. And we can do that because, I mean, we are not able to measure what is going to happen in the future because we can't, but we can use ocean models to predict what is going to happen. Uh, I don't know if people are familiar with computer simulations, but an ocean model and a computer simulation simulating what is going to happen in the future is similar to what we do uh, for the weather forecast. We do the weather forecast for tomorrow and we can use a similar system to predict what is going to happen tomorrow, but also in the next decades in, in the ocean. And we can do that for different scenarios. So for example, what is going to happen with climate change or what is going to happen if we put 7,000 turbines in, in the water. I mean, We don't have those models yet, actually. We are working on how to tune, how to modify our models to be able to predict that. But um, it's something that uh, it will uh, allow us to know if those changes are acceptable or not, or which are the locations that are best uh, for that technology or, or the ones that we should avoid, for example. I was going to ask you, what is the answer in 10 years' time? But I won't, I'll save that. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Um, so, Chris, I'm just going to direct this one to you for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. So, obviously, you, you know, you've worked quite a lot with big uh, commercial organizations in, in the research that you do, um, really to provide that sort of scientific advice and guidance. You know, do you get the sense that industry understands that we need to understand our wider ocean environment from a scientific perspective? perspective sort of in relation to the solutions that they're developing be it you know ccs or, or anything else have they made that link yet well a absolutely and I, i have to say that everyone i've ever engaged with is absolutely starting from the fundamentals starting at the nature-based solutions they're closing the name they are driven by natural processes so understanding how those processes work how they are varying how they will be impacted by climate change. Now, this is an ongoing event, it's, it's going to happen, so we can start to predict how those processes will naturally vary, and then how we can adjust or alter those processes in either a geoengineering context or just uh, utilize them to our advantage in terms of better understanding and protecting areas which are naturally excellent at sequestering carbon. So uh, a lot of uh, companies have approached are naturally looking at this to underpin the basis of those approaches being put forward. From a more industrial uh, approach, when you're looking at companies who are looking at uh, reutilizing old uh, decommissioned oil and gas platforms, then uh, there's a critical need to understand how any marine environments could potentially be Im impacted by these processes. And this is where this ocean modeling comes into context, because we can combine ocean models, which are constantly being developed and updated in terms of our computing power, but combine that with the uh, increasing uh, evidence that we're collecting through the deployment of our Uh, in situ sensors and through the uh, marine surveys that are being conducted and we're getting more and more data all the time from around the world and combining the two enables us to better understand and predict how those environments are responding and may respond to future changes in, in climate and and as a function of those uh, CCS strategies. So I think that they're absolutely working with the scientists, they have their own scientific teams, they're working with us mm -hmm. and our colleagues to really best understand how to protect and utilize the marine environment. So, I mean, Claire, anything from your experience, more, I guess, more on the kind of nature-based side that you're, you're seeing? Um, in terms of, sorry. Well, in terms of, you know, industry, you know, having a desire not, not just to sort of engineer the solution necessarily, but understand the, the ocean environment that they would put that solution in. Sure, definitely. I think um, that is coming through. Um, lots of companies are becoming aware of their environmental impact. And so that is... Um, a factor in how they conduct their business. And one of the very interesting phenomena that we see in terms of um, managing the coast and, and these sort of charismatic environments, if you like, is that a lot of people want to invest in that, you know, and obviously there's sort of the voluntary aspect of investing in that in terms of it's just good business to take care of the environment. 
but also we're moving towards uh, legislation which will limit people's or, or companies' emissions, you know, the amount of uh, greenhouse gases they can emit. And of course, one of the, the potential ways to deal with that, if in the short term they can't decarbonize fast enough, is to offset those emissions. And so in terms of these kind of nature-based solutions, there's a big interest in, in the, the potential to use them as carbon credits, whereby you, you purchase some kind of scheme or you buy into some kind of scheme that actually manages the marine environment in some way and reduces uh, those emissions and thereby offsets mm -hmm. the emissions of the company. So I think that is something that's very prevalent in the minds of lots of commercial enterprises at the moment. I'm, I'm going to go right back to basics here. Doug, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, we talked loads about solutions, different aspects, sort of industry's perception and involvement. Uh, a basic question, what, you know, why is the ocean so important in, in climate change, you know, thinking over the next 30, 40 years? What is it that is so special about, about the ocean that will, will ultimately be at the core of you know, the solutions that we develop? Well, it's crystal to any rod at the moment. The oceans are still absorbing most of the pollutions, well, most of the carbon dioxide pollutants and everything other pollutants. It's the, you know, the deep sea sediments are just referred to as the ultimate sink. You know, nearly everything we produce ends up in the deep sea. Mm -hmm. So you saw that in the, you know, the very large press concerns around plastics into the oceans, etc. Whereas the solution to plastics in the ocean probably isn't in the ocean, it's actually stopping the plastics in the first place, in the same way that the climate is stopping the CO2 emissions in the first place that are going to help the climate. But the oceans, you're seeing a recognition with sort of COP, last year's COP in Glasgow, you saw the recognition of the oceans as being one of the most important components of the environmental system in terms of our management of climate change and our understanding of the way climate change. I think back to your sort of commercial comment earlier on, we get good engagement now from commercial organisations because they're recognising the leverage by talking to one group of scientists, you're actually bringing a global <coughs> scientific knowledge because scientists work together particularly in ocean science, it's big, it's broad scale, it's wide ranging, we can't do it alone, no one nation, never mind no one institute, you know, we do a good job, give a good crack at knock in trying to do <laughs> most of the planet, um, but we do all work internationally, it's big, it's expensive science to look at the oceans, and so by working, you know, that, that nexus you're seeing a much, much better work between commercial and scientists, is that they're getting the whole world of scientists actually involved, really, yeah. uh, so a phenomenal amount of, you know, that we're not in competition, really scientists yeah. uh so they're they're benefiting from that that collaboration anyone else yeah Chris. yeah i think i think it's also worth emphasizing that the scale of the oceans when you're thinking about the planetary solutions you know we are living in the blue planet that the oceans cover 70 percent of our surface so i think you know we need to recognize that they have they're not just the impacts they're not you know ocean acidification sea level rise you know global water, global warming sea warming uh deoxygenation there's lots of things to be concerned about the impacts of future climate change in the oceans, but they can also be part of the solution to it. And I think understanding where, when and how we can best optimise the solutions is what we're, we're trying to work and support um, uh, companies in terms of achieving that. But, you know, the, the oceans have that scalability potential. You know, um, we have to recognise, as I alluded to, that it's, it's an international problem. You know, every country you have their international waters, um, but, you know, in international space, you know, we need to work together collectively, both uh, as a scientific community, as commercial companies, to ensure that this is done in the right way. Okay, that's great. I, I, I suspect this is a topic that people want to get involved in. So I'm going to just hand over now to um, audience and uh, questions and, and online as well. Um, so I'm looking to the <coughs> audience and hoping for no silence when I do. Excellent, we've got a hand. Brilliant. <laughs> um, so as scientists, you know what has to be done um, and the problems faced by climate change and why the oceans are important, but often the decisions are made by policymakers and the public that vote in um, these policymakers, but they may feel out of touch with the ocean. So taking all of that into account, um, how can ocean literacy help climate change solutions and what can scientists do to aid this? So I, I can start that one if you like. So, so I think um, your question is an excellent one, and it's really, really important. And as the panel have alluded to, no one sector can solve this problem. It has to be everybody's on board or it's not going to work. And so one of the big projects that I'm running um, is looking at seagrasses around the UK. And actually what we're trying to do in that is understand the social and political barriers to restoration and preservation efforts. 
And um, you'll find there's a lot of, so you spoke about ocean literacy and a lot of the problem is people just don't know what's beneath the waves. You can't see, you know, you can't see seagrass most of the time. So why would you know about it? You know, so there's that piece about what's our responsibility as scientists? Well, we have to make sure we communicate what we're doing. So events such as these, you know, are really good for that. Um, but um, once uh, people have that information, we can make more informed decisions when when someone's going going to the polling booth you know if they're aware of what's going on and what what potentially their oceans can do for them then hopefully they'll vote for the the people who are um planning the most responsible uh, legislation to safeguard our future yeah just to, to add on that a lot, a lot of work is being done to actually understand how best to engage uh, and, and facilitate these types of solutions that we've been talking to, because it is a highly emotive topic for, for everyone, understandably. I think a lot of people feel either direct or associated connection to the oceans. It's something we naturally want to protect because of uh, you know, uh, many people's existence and sustenance relies on the oceans. However, as alluded to, you know, we, there's this recognition that you know, they're going to be impacted by climate change anyway. And so we you know we, if we don't do anything, then they're going to be changing. If we do do something, then how can we best achieve that in the, in the most uh, practical and effective and, and uh, safe uh, way? So um, there's lots of consultations ongoing. This is, you know, the number of projects are actually starting to reach out to uh, people to see where, you know, what are you comfortable with, what can be done, and equally coupling up with the scientific knowledge of, you know, what are those impacts? You know, or, you know, are they actually significant? We have a, a fear that, oh, you do anything in the oceans that it's going to perturb it. Well, this perturb perturbation is happening anyway. So, you know, can we actually offset some of that in, in an effective way and, and actually support the ecosystems in, in a way that's going to be beneficial for the long term? I have one more thing. I mean, on the ocean literacy, one of the key things is actually translating science into a language <laughs> that can be understood. I mean, I think before the Blue Planet, I mean, we've but I acknowledge the blue planet is probably what brought the oceans to COP. Um, you know, we we were pretty we have been in the past scientific scientists pretty poor at communicating with the general public. Um, and it's now we're at that, you know, the general public is suffering from things that are happening in the environment. We've got we know how, why, what is going to happen or might happen in the future based on models, etc. Communicating that in a way that the public understand then guides policy and because yeah, you know, you're gonna vote for someone that wants to do some good. Brilliant, thanks, thanks. I, um, we got any more questions from me? Yeah, we've got one here. Yeah, excellent. Um, do we have, well, I know you uh, alluded to earlier, we have a couple of success stories in terms of um, mitigating uh, climate impacts, but how how frequent are these success stories, or obviously it's been quite a doom and gloom? We talk about the virus like this. Well, I think at the moment, um, once you have a look at the, the evidence, it's it would be quite easy to become quite afraid, actually, to put it bluntly. However, I try to remain optimistic because as a species, our ability to innovate and come up with technology and come together and coordinate sort of got us into this mess in the first place. We managed to change the composition of the atmosphere of an entire planet, and that's pretty scary. But when you consider that's our ability, well, now the tide is starting to turn, excuse the pun, um, in that I think people are, you know, there's a general awareness now, an acceptance that, yes, this is happening, and we need to do something about it. So, you, you, you know, you're interested in specific examples, and I think at the moment it is in its infancy. So when we think about the, the kind of biological uh, solutions we might implement, there are certainly uh, coastal vegetative uh, systems that have been restored around the world, but that needs to speed up. And more than that, we need to stop destroying them in the first place. And we're destroying them in pretty basic ways. You know, we're still discharging sewerage into the Solent now and then. This is terrible. You know, this is really not good for marine habitats. So, so yeah, but I feel I feel like we can pull together. We can do this. So we're, we're in the infancy, but it's it's starting to build momentum, I really think. And we have done this. The Montreal Convention removing freons and, you know, depletion of the ozone as a whole. The reduction in... Um, sulfur dioxide emissions, which stopped acid rain and stopped just destroying the, you know, the Black Forest, 
we can do this, we can work together and we've got these training examples of actually how we've come together in the past at a global level to, to, to make these changes. Um, it's that sort of balance of pain now for benefit later. I mean, we, we did away with Freons over what, five, six years? Richard Rich probably knows, over five, six years, we literally did away with the whole Freon industry in, in, in refrigeration and changed how we do things to stop the ozone depletion. depletion. Uh, so yeah, we can do it. So I'm reasonably optimistic. Um, yeah, technology will save us. <laughs> I, I don't want to burst the, the high energy and the motivation around this, because I'm, I'm infused. But uh, Michaela, as someone who's got the enviable position of this foresight from a modeling perspective, how, how do you, you know, what's your research and what's your science telling you in this, in this space? Um pretty optimistic too, actually, because I think that the, the technology is there and it's just a matter of implementing it at a, at a real scale. And um, so when I was talking before about the possible negative aspects and the fact that we need to know them in advance, it doesn't mean that then we we are not going to put the wind turbines or the other string turbines. It's just, a it's just a matter of understanding what is acceptable. And for example, I've been, in the past, I've been studying what was going to happen if we were going to put a lot of tidal stream turbines. Tidal stream turbines are like wind turbines, but underwater. And actually, the, the UK, Scotland, is a very good place because there are very strong tidal currents. And there are some tidal turbines being tested in the Bentral Firth. And uh, I was simulating what was going to, what will happen if we put thousands of turbines and perturbing actually the tidal currents and the tidal dynamics. Uh, and then I was comparing those changes due to so many turbines with the, um, with the changes that we are going to have with climate change and, the, and, and comparing them. I mean, the comparison is like uh, climate change is going to be 10 times bigger than the effect of tidal stream energy extraction at such a big scale. So um, the take home message of this is that even if there are going to be some negative effects, they are acceptable because we are going to, um, uh, because in, in that way, we are not going to see much larger effects that are the effects of climate change. So I, I guess um, just just thinking about, um, I guess, the, the potential impacts on, on our ocean from some of these solutions. Um, I, I think what I'm hearing is that, that the oceans are pretty tolerant, pretty tolerant beast. You know, it, it can deal with quite a lot thrown at it be it engineered solutions, clearly nature-based solutions are the win-win, as you alluded to, um, Chris. Is, is there anything that we shouldn't be doing? You know, if, when, if we're in solution mode, you know, where, where's the line where it, something does become problematic in your view, either from a scientific perspective or from a, from a real life, you know, coastal hazard for someone living there? Is there anything, is there a line that we should not cross when we're in solution mode? Well, th there are examples of people conducting trials and experiments when, in terms of iron fertilization that haven't been well conceived and well planned out and well conducted, and they have automatically created lots of negative press, negative, negative attention. And, and I think it's that, that jumping in with two feet, so to speak, uh, without really considering the, the broad implications of what's being done. And, and that's the risk. Now, it's not to say that uh, iron solution, iron fertilization can't be part of the, the, the pool of activities, but it needs to be assessed thoroughly and properly, scientifically with rigor, before it's actually uh, conducted, because it may not be applicable in all circumstances. And having that knowledge and understanding is essential. So I think there's lots of techniques out there, and um, I think we just need to, to pursue them. As, as scientists on this panel, we will naturally be hesitant we know we want to get it right and ensure 100% uh, safety. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's the commercial implications. There are net zero deadlines. They are coming closer. We have to, to achieve them for our future generation's sake. So we need to be pulled out of our comfort zone in order to enable companies to meet those de target deadlines. And we, as, as a global population, have to be comfortable with like, well, what are we going to offset? You know, what other, what level of impact are we happy with in either the oceans or at land, you know, CO2 has got to go somewhere. If it's not going to be in our terrestrial reservoirs, then it's got to be at sea. 
So, you know, we have to make decisions as a global community to say, this is where we're heading, what are we going to do, uh, if not, and, and how can we best get there? I've got a couple of hands up here, they're both at the same time, I'm afraid, so... I... <laughs> Hello, sure. um, kind of going on, sort of optimism. Uh, a lot more young people are going into science, and a lot more young people have kind of taken to the interest of it, especially in climate, it's like a lot more, I think, in the media and stuff. Um, do you think that this next generation is going to be really focused on, you know, climate solutions? And do you think, if so, how important that will be in terms of actually getting to solutions with an entire generational backing of it, as opposed to what we've seen before? So I think with that, I would say you're right. There does seem to be, you know, it's it's unequivocal in the younger generations. There seems to be a, a greater sort of literacy in terms of the environmental <laughs> threats that we face right now and, and definitely more sort of action in terms of, you know, how can I live my life in a way that's going to minimise my impact? So that definitely seems to be the case that it is more prevalent in the young generation. But... I would say that um, we can't afford to wait for that young generation to sort of be the ones making the decisions. You know, it has to be an ongoing process that we're all involved in and um, it starts now, really. So I think it's important that that the youth, you know, the youth are going to be extremely important. Um, but yes, it's the here and now. We, we can't give up trying to reach those unconvinced people, as it were, you know. One thing on that, you've got a real leverage aspect there, that, that young people in the past didn't use to vote, so politicians didn't really care about the young people. I think you saw with the, you know, Obama and, and, and a real mobilisation of the young voters around the planet, I think there's a real push there as well in, the, in, in shaping politicians and how they do things. And I think you ignore the youth vote at, 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 you know, at your risk because you won't get elected. Um, and I think in the past they didn't really care because only people like me voted. So, <laughs> you know, older white people. Uh, so, yeah, that whole mobilisation uh, is, is, is a real political move that will hopefully translate into, into good things in the environment in terms of politicians doing things. Yeah, I, I just want to say that I've been a marine geoscientist for 20 years and I've never seen a field develop as sw swiftly as ocean-based carbon dioxide removal is. This is really ramping up very, very quickly and in no doubt support, you know, a reflection of the support but also the urgency. I think that urgency is recognised, it's recognised by politicians, it's recognised by people, and I think just it's finding the right way to achieve that. Uh, and I think we also need to just kind of recognise that we now live in a global society. You know, this was not the case, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago. You know, there is a global voice now. People are pulling together to tackle this problem, and that is what is needed to solve this, these issues, because it is a global issue. Uh, and I think that is where the future generation is going to come to play. You know, we're going to have... Uh, our own net zero oceanographic capabilities, that's all of our internal targets. You know, there's going to be other net zero targets internationally for travel. You know, again, we need to, to embrace that, support that, and then find ways to live as a, as a new community uh, moving forward. And I think that's, that's the encouragement for the future. Britt, there was a question over there. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask what you think the, the biggest barrier is to the implementation of some of these solutions. Is it uncertainty over the long term consequences? Of some of these is it purely like logistical how like practically getting this infrastructure set up or is it just social and political barriers I could, i've talked to ccs first <laughs> what i know most of uh, so ccs varies country by country so uh, germany hates ccs the the public really don't like ccs um UK, there's more acceptance around it. America, uh, the US, there's more acceptance around it. Canada, it's being utilised on land. Um, there is still the risk. People in the public are still a little bit disturbed as to how, whether it leaks, whether you could see it. Um, and financially, it's an expensive process to get it off the ground because we still haven't got a carbon tax credit system that works. If you really charged carbon out of what it costs in terms of all the damages to the environment, we wouldn't be, char you know, we wouldn't be trading carbon at $30 a tonne be trading carbon at three thousand dollars a ton to actually work out actually what it's costing us every man woman child and animal on this planet but yeah so that is the biggest limit they say is, is financially but the cost of not doing anything i would argue is far far greater 
I, I guess, you know, it, it varies per technique that you're taking. You know, we, we, there are quick wins, there are easy wins. You know, for some of these uh, solutions like TCS, we already have the infrastructure, you know, um, but when the critical thing for us is not to just look at the solutions, it's to look at the problem. That's where marine renewables come in. Stopping those CO2 emissions has to start there. Um, about the limitations of uh, the technology of marine renewables. I mean, putting something in water that has to stay there for a long time is not that easy because whatever, I mean, if you put something there, it's going to be full of microorganisms in uh, very little time. So you need to, there are still some technological developments needed to um, to overcome some of these problems, but still it's possible. And of course, they need to be economically viable as solutions. That's another important point. But since we need it, they must become. Well, I think that's about all we've got time for today. So some really insightful discussion. Uh, I'm motivated. I hope everyone else is. I think we're gonna. I think we're gonna make it through, which is <laughs> which is brilliant. So I can yeah, I can drive home safely. Thank you. Um, so thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you, panelists, for some really really insightful um, uh, information and, and and discussion. And uh, we'll close it there for today. Thank you. <laughs>